Hello! Today I'm going to be porting a .NET Framework WPF app to .NET Core 3. Now this video will be a little longer than normal for me because I want to show the entire porting process start to finish. So I'm actually going to split it up and what you're watching now will be the first part of a five video series in which we do the end-to-end -end migration of a WPF application to .NET Core. We recently had a blog post and Channel 9 video where one of our .NET PMs, Olia, ported a simple WinForms app to .NET Core. So this is going to be kind of similar to that. Some of the techniques will be the same. But it, I wanted to do this video also because by splitting it up and spending an hour or two on it, I think we can see a, a more complex example. And this way we get to see a WPF app uh, as opposed to the WinForms one which Olia ported. So the migration process that we're going to go through during these videos is four steps. The first step, which we're covering in this video, is, is all about getting ready to port. It's about understanding the dependencies the project has so that we know what work we have ahead of us, and getting the existing .NET Framework project into a state that will make it easy to port in the subsequent steps. The second step is actually migrating the project file itself. .NET Core projects use the new SDK style CS proj file format, so you need to either create a new project file for your .NET Core port, or you need to update the existing CS proj file to use the SDK style. The third step is what people often think of when they think about porting to .NET Core, which is making the code level fixes to get it building against uh, the .NET Core target. So that would be you know, API level differences that need addressed either because of changes in the .NET framework or in third party packages you use. Um, because we're using WCF here, we're going to have to regenerate our WCF client and so on. So it's all about those sort of code level fix up. And this will actually be two videos. This will be videos three and four since it's the lion's share of the work. And then the final step is running and testing the application. People sometimes think that once it builds, you're done, but there are a number of differences between .NET Framework and .NET Core that don't show up until runtime. So you really do need to make sure that you've tested the app, you've exercised its interesting code paths on .NET Core, and make sure that it runs well. So that will be our fifth and final video. So the app that we're porting is, um, you know, like I said, it's a step up from Hello World, but it's still fairly simple. It's not especially large. But I wanted to make it interesting by using some dependencies that might be uh, non-trivial to port and that are common in real-world WPF applications. So this app is a commodity trading application. I call it Bean Trader. You trade imaginary beans with other users. And it communicates with a backend service using uh, WCF. It has a duplex net TCP binding. Um, and so, and it, so it's got that WCF dependency. It also uses some third-party UI controls from my apps Metro. Uh, uses dependency injection from Castle Windsor and a whole variety of um, .NET uh, APIs that are common in WPF apps, like um, getting settings from an app config file or the registry using uh, a variety of resources and so on. The uh, app is up on GitHub, so you can go check it out if you want at github.com slash mjrusso slash beantrader. Uh, you will find the WPF app in the beantrader client folder. Beantrader server has that backend WCF service, which you can just run locally. I have it hosted up in Azure right now. Um, and so you can check this out for yourself. I've got some notes on how the migration should be done. Uh, and actually, if you take a look at the branches, there's a .NET Core branch, which has the final state uh, already ported to .NET Core and .NET Framework. So you can find the, you know, the final ported product in the .NET Core branch. NetFX and Master right now are the same. They have the initial state of the project. And Migration Process is a branch where I'm going to commit after each of the videos I record so that you can see the state of the project as it progresses through the migration process. Um, also, I do want to mention that this WPF app is not meant to be used as a WPS best practice sample or anything. It's not a reference app for WPF. Uh, and that's both because I'm not a WPF expert and because I intentionally did some things in sort of roundabout ways in this application to make the porting a little bit more interesting. This is all about the migration process from .NET Framework to .NET Core, not about showcasing the right ways to do things in WPF. Just a quick warning. 
So uh, let me briefly demo this app for you, and then we'll go ahead and port it. And I'm not going to spend a long time on the demo because the app itself is not the interesting part. It's the way we make it work on core. But if we run it, you see we've got this Bean Trader UI. It's styled with my app's uh, themes and accents. And I can log in, and it shows me how many beans I have, and it shows me trades that people have proposed. Uh, I will also start up a second uh, instance of this app so that we can sort of see how in real time uh, things are updated. Let's log in here as a different user, maybe as Daniel. And then here I can see, okay, Daniel uh, will give me 20 red beans for 10 blue and 5 greens. If I accept it, you can see that both users are notified, bean counts are updated, and so on. Then maybe I can make a, now I've got a lot of blue beans, so maybe I want to give 5 blue beans and get, I don't know, 5 green beans. And then that shows up for both users as well. So that's the application. Nothing fancy, but it's um, hopefully a little bit more real world than just you know, saying hello on the screen because we're using a WCF client, we're using app configuration, we're using uh, my apps, Metro, uh, dialogues, and, and so on. So let's go ahead and port this. The first step, like I said, is that we want to prepare and understand the work that we have ahead of us. And so we're going to look at our dependencies. We're going to look at third-party dependencies, and we're going to look at .NET dependencies. For the third-party ones, the first step, if you have a packages.config file, we're going to want to change this because the packages config file lists all of the NuGet packages that our project depends on. And in fact, it lists the sort of transitive uh, closure of all of the NuGet packages. Uh, in .NET Core, using the new SDK style project, we no longer use packages.config. Instead, we use the new, newer package reference format to um, pull in NuGet dependencies. So one of the things you're going to want to do to get your project ready to port is you're going to want to make that transition. So right-click on packages.config and click migrate packages.config to package reference if you haven't done this already with your project. And this is going to do two things for us. First, it's going to migrate to the new package reference format so that we can just copy and paste our NuGet references from the old project into the new one, and it'll make that, um, that process super easy in the next video. And it allows us to only reference top-level projects instead of the whole you know, transitive dependency tree. So the migration tool in Visual Studio is really nice. It identifies the top-level projects, and then we have an opportunity to select any other um, NuGet packages that are dependent on that we'd like to promote to top-level dependencies. In this case, I don't want to make any of those top-level. And then when we click OK, it makes the changes. It's going to remove our packages.config file, and it will update the csproj file to use package reference instead. So we'll let this finish. Generates a little report showing uh, what changed. That's fine. And let's go ahead, we'll save the changes to the project file, and then I'm actually going to open this up in Visual Studio Code so that we can easily see the csproj file without having to um, without having to unload the project in Visual Studio. And you can see that down at the bottom of the project file, there's a new item group with these package reference elements. And so this is the replacement for packages.config. And like I said, one of the nice things about this uh, format is that now I'm just looking at the top level packages. So these are the packages that I need to have present for my project to work and that are going to need to work on .NET Core. So at this point, I can review these and make sure that I have uh, a version that's going to work for me when I actually do the .NET Core migration. So if I go out to NuGet.org, we can start looking some of these up and see what our options are. So we have Castle Windsor, for example. And uh, we're using Castle Windsor version 4.1.1, so I'll click on that version. And you can see in dependencies that it has .NET Framework dependencies and .NET Standard 1.6 dependencies. So this package should work as is on .NET Core, because .NET Core, of course, can depend on .NET Standard packages as well. Another view you can use instead of NuGet.org, if it's hard for you to tell which uh, .NET targets are supported, you go out to Fugit.org. It's the exact same URL, but replace the N in NuGet with an F. This is a site that some community members made that uh, gives another view into NuGet packages. It gives a little more details as far as what APIs are present, and it specifically lists frameworks um, 
up at the top here so we can see .NET 4.5 and .NET Standard 1.6. So this package is fine. We can also look at, say, maapps.metro, and we see that, once it loads here, Maps Metro uh, version 2 at least supports .NET Framework and .NET Core 3.0, but we're using version 1.6.5, so if we go back to that, we see, ah, here it doesn't support .NET uh, Core, it only supports .NET Framework. This can be similar if I look up, for example, the Neato Async or the Microsoft Azure Common libraries. All of these support .NET Core or .NET Standard in a more recent version. So here, 221 supports .NET Standard 1.4. But some of the older versions that my initial sample depended on don't support .NET Standard. This is going to be common. A lot of older WPF and WinForms applications will be using older versions of NuGet packages that don't support .NET Framework, or, I mean .NET Standard or .NET Core, <laughs> but they have newer versions that do. So that's the second thing you can do to get ready to port. You remember that I said you can get ready to port by migrating to the package reference format for your NuGet packages. The other thing you can do is upgrade to newer versions so that you know when you go to .NET Core you'll be able to use the same NuGet packages you were using previously. Now sometimes that may um, take a little bit of work. Like if we make a major version change, like from Mobs Metro 1 to 2, there could be breaking changes. So um, in some cases you may not want to actually update because you don't want to make all of the changes to, to use this new, new version, but eventually that should be done. And so this is a good time to take care of it if you're able to, because it's going to make the migration a little bit easier. Now what if you don't find a, an updated version that um, references .NET Standard or .NET Core? Or what if you really don't want to move because you don't want to take some change in surface area of newer versions of these packages? It's possible to depend on .NET Framework libraries and NuGet packages from .NET Core applications. And we allow that because the surface areas are so similar nowadays that those sorts of dependencies often work, but they don't always work. And so you, if you're going to depend on a .NET Framework package, you need to be a little bit cautious about it. You need to keep in mind that that's going to require some extra testing, because what will happen is we'll allow it to build, but at runtime, when you're running on .NET Core, if your .NET Framework DLL or NuGet package that you're depending on calls an API that doesn't exist on .NET uh, Core, that only exists on .NET Framework, you're going to get a runtime error. And so there's an extra test burden if you depend on older uh, .NET Framework packages or libraries. But we allow it because there are some situations where an old NuGet package hasn't been updated in years. It would work fine on .NET Core, it just hasn't been retargeted. So in those cases, we allow you to use those, those libraries. They work. Um, just make sure that you test that at runtime you're not going to get a missing method exception or something like that. Okay. So uh, we can go through these uh, individually, but I, I know that they all either are supported on Net Standard or Net Core or have updated versions that are. And I'm not going to update to the newer versions now. I'll do that in the next video in the interest of keeping this first one short. But that's reviewing your, your third-party dependencies. The other thing we want to look at is first part, uh, you know, .NET dependencies, like different APIs we're calling from the .NET framework to make sure that those same APIs exist in the .NET Core surface area. And for that, we're going to use the .NET Core port the .NET Portability Analyzer, which is a tool that the .NET team uh, created and maintains that will look at your binaries, find all of the .NET APIs that are called, and then produce a report showing whether those APIs are available on different .NET targets that you care about. Um, the tool works both as a Visual Studio plugin or from the command line. Now, we've talked about this tool a lot in the past, so if you're already familiar with it, you can be done with this video and move on to the next one, because the next five or six minutes will be review. Uh, but for folks who haven't used the tool before, let me show you quickly how it works. I, like I said, you can use it from Visual Studio or from the command line. Both work well. I'm going to do it from the command line, just because I feel like we demo that less often, and I think it's a great option. So if you run API port, you'll see there's uh, a few different commands you can run. List targets will show all of the .NET targets that you can get information on. List output formats will show the different output formats that we can use. I'll run that quickly. Uh, you can get output, form, output formatted as HTML, Excel, or JSON. And then the, the command that we really care about is analyze, uh, which is actually going to do the analysis of our project. So we'll do API port analyze 
dash f give the path to our uh, the binaries that we want analyzed dash r to specify which output formats I want and I like to do both HTML and Excel because I think they're both useful. The HTML report, in my opinion, is the most human readable and the easiest to get an overall sense of what APIs are present or missing. The Excel report is nice though because, of course, it's writable. You can put notes in a new column. So if you're reviewing this with a team or working through maybe migrating away from some APIs that aren't available on .NET, on .NET Core, you can use the Excel spreadsheet to track that, keep notes, and so on. And then we'll do dash T to specify the .NET target that we want to use. I'll say .NET Core. And I don't. I could specify which version of .NET Core, but by default, um, all of the targets will pick the latest version. And in this case, that's .NET Core 3.0. So I run the tool. It has produced this HTML file as well as the Excel spreadsheet you see. So let's pop this open and see what's in here. At the top, we have all of the binaries that were found in that path that I provided and how compatible they are with .NET Core. And you can see these are fairly high numbers, which is nice. But something I want to emphasize is that you shouldn't look too much at this, this number. It doesn't mean a whole lot. You may have a 85 or 90% here, and that's okay because the APIs that you're depending on are easily worked around, or there are other alternatives that you can use instead. You might have a 98% here and have a big problem because you're using some APIs like um, creating app domains or remoting APIs that simply aren't supported on .NET Core, so now you have more work ahead of you. This single number doesn't tell you a whole lot. What you really need to look at is to drill into the, eight, the binaries that you own the source code for. So in this case, that's only this top one, Bean Trader Client. And look at the APIs that are missing, which would be the ones with these red X's here in the .NET Core column. Make sure that for all of those, you have an idea of how to work around them. In this case, the only APIs that are missing from the Bean Trader Client app are some WCF client-based APIs. Close and open are missing. I'm not super worried about these because I know that WCF client APIs are generally supported on .NET Core. Not all WCF client APIs, but um, a good subsection. And so certainly there are ways to open and close WCF clients. There are uh, probably alternative APIs I can use here, probably async alternatives to these synchronous ones that are no longer present. So this makes me feel pretty good. Now, we do have information on our other binaries, but this is not interesting either because I don't own the source. There's nothing I can do about these ones, like Castle Windsor. Castle Windsor is missing some system.web APIs that it was using. If this was my code, we'd have to migrate to using like, some ASP.NET Core alternatives. And for the uh, logical get data, set data stuff, I would use async locals. But I don't own Castle Windsor. And in fact, remember we looked and we saw that Castle Windsor version 4.1.1 is uh, targets .NET Framework and .NET Standard 1.6. So because it targets .NET Standard 1.6, I have confidence that there is a Castle Windsor binary in that NuGet package that's going to work for me. This particular one that was in my binary output folder that targets .NET Framework, well, maybe it doesn't work, but the Castle Windsor package supports .NET Standard. So there's another binary that will be used that will work. So this one doesn't even really matter. So these, these other libraries, these other binaries, you need to make sure that y there are versions of these that work, but we've already done that by looking through the NuGet package dependencies and other third-party dependencies that our, our project has and making sure that there are alternatives there that will work for .NET Core. And so when we look at the API port report, you really only need to look at things that you own and just look at these APIs to make sure there's nothing really crucial here that's going to block you. Um, so at this point, I feel pretty good about porting to .NET Core. We've reviewed our NuGet package dependencies. We've upgraded to use package reference format, which will make the migration easier. And we've looked at an API portability report to make sure that we understand which .NET APIs we're depending on may not be present once we migrate to .NET Core so that we know that those are things that we can work around. At this point, we're ready to start the migration, which we'll do in video two. Welcome back to migrating a .NET Framework WPF app to .NET Core 3. In this second video, we're going to actually start the migration now that we've done the preparatory work. We're going to create a new CS proj, make sure that we have updated versions of our NuGet packages, uh, so that we'll be all set up for video 3 where we actually start making code changes. So uh, again, I see migration as a four-step process where you sort of prepare, you get the project file set up, and adjust NuGet packages and other third-party dependency references. 
then a fourth step where you fix the code and then you run and you test and you find any runtime differences and you account for those. So we're on step two now. Now, one of the first things we have to think about when we're setting up our new CS project file is where does this project file live? That might not seem on the surface like a very interesting decision, but it actually is because it's going to, uh, no matter what answer we give to that question, we're going to have some challenges. Now, the first option, and the one that I would recommend starting, you know, maybe six months from now or whatever, .NET Core 3 is in a state that you can go live on it, would be to just replace the old project file. You could imagine uh, getting rid of the old project file, putting a new one in its place, and if you want to target both .NET Framework and .NET Core, you can use multi-targeting to do that. Right now, that's not a great option because multi-targeting doesn't work well with the designer. So if you need to go in and use the WF the WPF designer to shift some UI elements or drop something in, you're not going to get to do that with this new project, or at least it may not always work well. Multi-targeting allows it to work occasionally, but you can't count on it, so you'll just be doing your UI updates in XAML. Um, the whole multi-targeting process, I think, is, is the way we're going to want to do this eventually, but I don't think that experience is there yet in the .NET Core 3 previews. So if we don't do that yet, then we're going to have two project files, assuming that we want to continue building for .NET Framework, since that's the thing that we can go live on now and that has the designer support. So we either can put the c -sharp project files next to each other in the same directory, or we put them in separate directories. If we put them next to each other in the same directory, that's going to make it easy to reference all the source and the XAML and the resources, because they're all going to be in the same places relatively. But that's going to introduce a challenge because these two CS project files are going to have the same default intermediate output and the same bin folders. So they're, they're going to get in each other's way when they're restoring packages, when they're building. So you're going to have to make some changes to actually have them use separate output folders. And unfortunately, there's actually a couple issues right now with publishing a .NET Core app when you've uh, changed the intermediate output folder, or at least a .NET Core WPF app, uh, such that you need to clean you do a .NET clean prior to running .NET publish. Totally something you can work around, but there's just some rough edges here, and it's going to be a little bit of a hassle. Now, again, this is a perfectly good option, but we're going to have to do a little bit of work to, to make it do what we want as far as just updating these output paths. So you might think, okay, well, you know, I'll avoid that by putting these in separate directories. So that's going to solve all the problems I just talked about, but now you're going to have a problem. The new .NET Core project file uh, format doesn't need to explicitly depend on C-sharp source, XAML pages, or uh, ResX files that are in its, in its directory or in uh, directories underneath its you know, directory. And if you're in a separate folder with your CS project, you don't get that benefit. You're going to have to explicitly reference all those things. Worse, because you know, just adding those references isn't so bad. That's just like we used to do it with the old project file format. <laughs> Worse, there's currently some issues um, I can go out and um, show you this GitHub issue, where right now you have to explicitly link uh, those files. Um, you know, the automatic link generation isn't working. So in order for some XAML build processes, you actually need to add a link element to your pages so that they show up in the right relative path from your project file's point of view. So you might say, I'm going to reference dot dot slash old project slash main window Dot .xaml, but you also need to add a link element to that, saying that we link it to just main window .xaml so that it doesn't see that um, directory traversal because that will, will mess up some of the WPF build steps. So again, that's totally solvable, not blocking at all. It just means if we go this route, there's a few extra steps we have to take. So eventually, a year from now, six months from now, whatever, we're just going to replace the old project file with a new one that multi-targets, everything will be great. In the interim, we have to decide between these other two options, both of which have a couple of rough edges, but shouldn't be blocking. Um, so, you know, just heads up about that. So, um, for, for this demo, let's go ahead and create a new project, and we're going to actually use the uh, in the same directory approach because I know there's been some other videos recently where people put them in separate directories and so just for variety's sake let's see what this path looks like and um, 
we, you know, we'll go from there. So here we are in Visual Studio. So we need to create a new .NET Core project. This could just be right click add new project but again I want to put it in the same folder and I don't want like the program.cs that gets auto generated all that stuff so I'm actually just going to create the CS project directly and rather than create it by hand which would be one option I'm going to go to a temporary directory and I'm going to say dotnet new WPF this way I get the um, template and I don't have to remember what the SDK is called and stuff like that because you can see here's the contents of this auto-generated CS project file. It's got the nice Windows desktop SDK, it's got that .NET Core app 3.0, it's the target framework, WinEx, the output, uses WPF True. This is what we want our project file to look like initially. So I'm going to come into VS Code, add a file, I'm going to call it Bean Trader Client Core, or .core.cs project because I can't call it bean trader client.cs project since that would conflict. And I'm just going to paste this in. All right, there we go. We've got a, a CS project file. Now, for a simple app, maybe a hello world or something a little bit more complicated, we would be done. Because if I come over into Visual Studio and I add that project to my solution, what you're going to see, uh, let's see, come in here and add it, you'll see that we already have you know all of the c-sharp sources referenced my uh, resx files are here we've got uh, our xaml in the views folder because a lot of that stuff is automatically included by the new project file format it automatically looks for those and includes them in the right way in the project uh, in a more complex project like this one, though, we're going to want to go through and, and actually look at the old CS project to see if there's anything else we have to change, because there will be some things that will be a little bit different here that we want to make sure are done right in the new project file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here in VS Code. I'm going to open both the old and the new project file. I'm going to put them side by side. And let's go ahead and look through the old project file to see which parts of it we need to bring over into the new project file. Okay, so let's go through and see which of these properties and um, items we need in our new CS proj. So we've got these imports. We don't need this because we reference an SDK, and an SDK um, attribute on the project will imply that we're importing props and targets that are necessary to build this type of a project. So that takes care of sort of the standard uh, imports. So we skip over that. We do probably want root namespace and assembly name because if we add new files, we want them to use that namespace by default, and we want the app to build to be called Bean Trader Client, so it looks exactly like the old one, not Bean Trader Client Core, despite the different CS proj name. We don't need to auto generate binding redirects because .NET Core doesn't use binding redirects. Uh, I don't use these constants in my my project, but this reminds me that I do probably want to add a constant uh, because I find it's useful to define a constant indicating that we're building for .NET Core so that if we have source shared between the .NET Framework and .NET Core projects, in some cases we may need to do one thing for .NET Core, one thing for .NET Framework if there's small API differences or something. So having this constant available makes it easy to use a pound if to, to do that. Um, there's an application icon, we need that, so we'll bring our uh, app icon over. And then here's the uh, things that we're building. Most of these we won't need, like the application definition being, you know, including app.xaml, that's done by default. All C sharp files in or under this directory are compiled by default, so we skip those. XAML pages are uh, included by default, so we skip those. Here's a resource. Embedded resources are included, but resources are not. So we need an item group where we can add this resource. We also uh, have to add content, typically. Uh, well, I mean, some things will be added by, by default as content, but this one won't. This one's interesting because, look, it's a XAML file, but I'm adding it as content. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm using Ma Apps theming uh, to change like the color scheme or the accent of my app dynamically, and customers can choose which theme they want. But I'm actually loading some of the themes from disk so that we can have a style defined in XAML on disk, and then at runtime we load that 
dynamically, and we use it as a theme. So that means that this XAML file does not need to be a page, but it should be content. So I'm actually going to copy it as content. Because actually, if I come over and look in Visual Studio, you will see that oops, that XAML page is right now included as a page, because that's what happens by default. So instead, we're going to add it as content, and I'm actually going to remove it as a page. And I'm not only going to remo remove default accent .xaml, I'm going to remove, I'm going to use a globbing pattern like you can with the new project files. I'm going to remove that file in any folder, not just the resources themes default. So that way after we copy it to our output directory or to an intermediate output directory, we won't start uh, building it as a XAML page from there either. Okay, these ones are fine. AssemblyInfo.cs is an interesting one. It's included automatically, so that's good. But if we look at what AssemblyInfo.cs is, it has a bunch of assembly attributes. And this was part of our new project template when we created the WPF app originally on .NET Framework. And it has these attributes for things like assembly title, copyright culture, and so on. And these assembly level attributes are auto-generated in .NET Core based on properties in your project file. So we actually can run into an issue here because these attributes will conflict with the auto-generated ones. Now if this was a new project, it wouldn't be a problem because we wouldn't have assemblyinfo.cs. We would just set properties in our CS proj to define those values. But in this case, uh, it does become a problem. So I'm going to add a property called generate assembly info, and I will change that to false instead of its default true. And what that means is that we're not going to auto-generate those assembly level attributes, and therefore we'll just use this one instead. Uh, other things that might be interesting, the app config is included automatically, embedded resources are included automatically. Uh, resources are not, like I said, if we come over here and look, um, we can take a look at the images, and these images are um, con build type none, so they're in the none group. And in fact, I want them to be um, resources so that they're embedded in my assembly. So I need to add more resources here, but again, we can use that globbing pattern. So instead of adding each image in individually, I can add all PNG files anywhere under the directory the CS project is in. Or if I want to, I could say just under resources or resource images, you could scope it. But I'm going to include all the PNG files as resources. Finally, remember I said in the last video that by switching our NuGet dependencies to use package reference um, syntax instead of using a packages.config file, that would make things easier later. Well, here's what it makes easier. It means that I can copy and just paste that item group, and this is going to work in uh, this in this CS proj the same as it the same as it would have worked uh, previously so we don't need to uh, make any changes here we just pick up our NuGet references we plop them down here and we are good to go so at this point the CS proj file is essentially done the only thing that's left to be done is to update the NuGet packages to the right versions or to change them if we need to change them. So I can come out to my command prompt here and do a .NET restore and I have to specify which project since I have two CS proj files here now. And I can do this from Visual Studio as well. There's a lot of stuff that can be done either from the Visual Studio IDE or from the command prompt. Both are great, it's just a matter of preference. So I'll sort of bounce back and forth so you can see both ways for a lot of the operations that I'm doing. In this case, I did a .NET restore. I get some warnings that there are packages that are targeting .NET Framework that I'm using instead of .NET Core. And remember, we talked about this previously. That's expected. This is the point where I'm going to need to update some of those. So there's different ways we can update them. Uh, one way is to do a .NET add, and then I specify the package that I'm adding to, and I then say package and I need to give the, the name of the package. So I'll say maapps.metro. And this will update the maapps uh, reference to, oh, actually, it'll update it to the latest stable version. And in our case, we don't want the stable version. 
we want the one we found out on uh, on NuGet that supported .NET Core. So I will search for uh, apps.metro. Uh, it's this 2.0 alpha that we want. So I'll actually copy that version so I get the version right. We will add that. And so by doing a .NET add package, I'm now updating the package version that we're depending on to a more recent one, which supports .NET Core. Okay, if we come over to Visual Studio, we can do the same thing from here. If we go to Manage NuGet Packages, and see the ones that are installed. So we can take things like the Microsoft Azure Common. I know, see, does, uh, the 2.0 version did not support .NET Standard or .NET Core, but the latest stable one does support that, so we're going to update. Say yes. We'll let that update. And then you can see here some of the other warnings. There's Microsoft Identity Model. Clients Active Directory did not target .NET, frame or .NET Core, but the newer version does. So I update that one to 4.5.1 instead of version 2.29. And at this point, oh, and then the Neato Async is another one that um, has a pre-release that supports .NET Core. So I'm going to update from 401 to 500 pre-05. And that should be all of my packages that need to be updated. And again, in the first step, we went through and sort of understood what our packages were so that we knew if we were going to have any issues. So we sort of know now what needs updated, and we can do those updates pretty quickly. Let's do one more .NET Restore. Ah. I have to save changes. When I make changes with the NuGet package manager here, it doesn't actually save the changes until uh, I hit that save button. So now I'll do a .NET restore. And I still have one warning. There's this Microsoft XAML Behaviors WPF. So what is that? I'm not depending on that directly. It must be a transitive dependency that comes in thanks to the closure of dependencies of things that I depend on at a top level. An easy way to find out how things are being pulled in so to go look in your object folder, there should be a file called project.assets.json. This is produced when you do a .NET restore, and it shows everything that's pulled in from NuGet. The libraries, the, the files, which packages they're part of, why those packages are referenced. So I can search for that Microsoft XAML behaviors. I see it is included because it's a dependency of the controls EX package. Controls EX, in turn, is included because it's a dependency of Ma Apps Metro. Okay, so this is interesting. My, my project is depending on a NuGet package that targets .NET Framework instead of .NET Core. You remember I said that's not really what you want. It's OK, but it's, it's not best. Uh, in this case, though, there's not a lot I can do about it because it's not a direct dependency. If I really wanted to use a different version of this Microsoft XAML Behaviors WPF uh, library, I could add a reference to a particular version of the NuGet package as a top-level dependency, and then everything would use that. But in this case, I don't think there even is a newer version. That's the latest version. So there's there's nothing to switch to. But because it's not a top-level dependency, it's it's more likely to be OK. Ma Apps Metro, with their version 2.0, has said this targets .NET Core. So they have a dependency, which depends on .NET Framework. But presumably, when they targeted .NET Core, they test it on that platform, and they're saying, yeah, this works on .NET Core. It's safe to use. So I'm going to trust the owners of the packages I'm depending on directly and say if they're pulling in something transitively that targets .NET Framework, it's probably fine. Because again, many .NET Framework packages can be used, and this one probably is safe, at least in the ways that Ma Apps Metro and Controls EX are using it. Otherwise, they would have trouble targeting .NET Core. So this particular warning is probably safe. And we can consider our project file done at this point. Um, it looks a lot like our old project file, but way smaller. We, we automatically include a bunch of stuff. We make a few modifications with globbing patterns. And we've got our references to other packages or projects. And that's really all you need to do. And now we have two project files, one that targets .NET Framework, one that targets .NET Core. Next up, we're going to do a .NET build. And we're going to start going through build errors and that's going to be, now that's the ma the majority of the work in a migration effort. So that's probably going to be two videos. So I think coming up in videos three and four, we're going to be uh, 
doing the code level changes that we need to make this app work on. Welcome back to migrating a WPF app to .NET Core 3. We're up to the third step of the migration process, which is actually fixing build issues and um, adjusting to account for API differences between .NET Framework and .NET Core. Uh, as you may remember, we've already done the preparation and the CS project creation, so now we're ready to go in and try to build the project and make necessary changes to get things up and running. So in general, the sorts of things that we're going to have to change are we're going to have to add some packages that we weren't referencing before to include APIs that maybe aren't in the .NET Core runtime package. This uh, especially would include Windows-specific APIs like registry, ACLs, WCF client APIs. These are types and methods that work on .NET Core but aren't included in the .NET Core runtime package uh, by default because they don't work cross-platform. And of course, .NET Core itself runs on Linux, Mac, Windows. So there's actually a helper meta package called Microsoft Windows Compatibility. I'll hop out to NuGet to show you that, that we're going to want to add. So Microsoft.Windows.Compatibility. In general, if you're porting a WPF or a WinForms app to .NET Core, you'll probably just want to add this reference up front because it's going to be useful. Um, we also will have to make some small differences where one code path is necessary on .NET Core, another one's necessary on .NET Framework. We can use a pound ifs for that and uh, constant, uh, constant definitions that will uh, allow us to differentiate between when we're building for .NET Core and when we're building for .NET Framework. Uh, and then as we go through this, we'll also want to be aware of just sort of the things that we'll need to change. And these things all would have showed up in the portability report at the very beginning. But uh, you know, if you if you want to go learn more, you can go out to our documentation where we talk about some of the APIs that are different between .NET Framework and .NET Core. App domains are different. Many of the app domain APIs are still available. So if you're just using app domain APIs to get information about the domain, that's likely to work. But creating new app domains is not supported. Remoting is another one where. Um, some pieces of remoting, like proxying, can be done with system reflection dispatch proxy and stuff like that, but most of like the IPC portions of remoting no longer work, so you'll need an alternative for that. Code access security is no longer supported. Security should not be done at the managed code level. It should be done uh, at the system level. So these are sorts of things that we may run into. In this particular app, I don't use any of these APIs because I understand that these are not supported, and I wanted this to be... Um, a project that was reasonable to port quickly, but you know, in your own apps, these are things that may require a little bit more re-architecture, and you might want to think about those up front before you dive into the porting process. So let's go ahead and demo fixing some compilation errors. There's going to be a few here. Well, start in Visual Studio, like like I did before. I'll do some of this in Visual Studio, some of it from the command line. And actually, the first error we're going to see it maybe belonged in the previous um, video. But something I see here is that this is actually an error trying to build the original .NET Framework project that we started from, that we haven't really changed yet. Um, the issue is that it's not a, it says there's no reference for .NET Framework 4.7.2, I need to rerun NuGet Restore. The reason it's giving me this is remember that for this porting effort, I decided to put the csproj files for the .NET Core project and the .NET Framework project in the same directory. That's one of a few different ways you can set this up. It's just as good as any, but they each have their own uh, you know, unique challenges. And the unique challenge of having them in the same directory is exactly this. What's happening here, uh, if I come to the right window, we have this project.assets.json that's created when we restore. It gets put in our intermediate output folder. And this is restored for .NET Core App 3.0 because this is the file that was generated when we did a .NET restore on our new .NET Core project. So there's a conflict here between the output paths for our new .NET Core project and our previous .NET Framework project. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to update these so that they're building to different locations. Now the obvious way to do that would be to come into the CS proj and add a you know, base output path is something, base intermediate output path is something else. But that doesn't work initially because we're using this SDK attribute. Let me tell you what this is. So in the new um, 
project file format, you can specify an SDK, and that will automatically import some props and targets files that you need to build that project type. So in this case, we're using the Windows Desktop SDK. As part of importing those props, it's going to make use of the intermediate output path so that if you change it later, it won't have an effect. So if I were to set some properties here for my intermediate output path, that's too late, and I already will have restored things or uh, built to the, to the wrong folders. So there's a couple ways to work around that. One option is to not use an SDK. Instead, you can get rid of this part of the um, project element, and you can just import the necessary props and targets files uh, yourself, and you can put them a little bit farther down maybe in your csproj file so that you have an opportunity to change things beforehand. The other possibility is that you can use what's called a directory.build.props file. And let me show you how that works. If I add directory.build.props, uh, by convention, msbuild knows to look for files named directorybuild.props or directory.targets or directory.build.targets in the same folder as the project that it's building or in any parent or ancestor directory. And if it finds one of those files, then it uses whatever props or targets are in there and applies them to uh, the project as if they were in that project file. And so we can use this as a way, and this is actually processed prior to any of the SDK stuff. So by having a directory.build.props file, we're able to change things like the intermediate output path before the SDK kicks in, and so it will take effect. Um, if you're interested, read more about this challenge and the different ways of solving it. Uh, there is, let me find it here. Here we go. There's a GitHub issue that I think does a good job uh, explaining why this is important and how to, how to solve the problem. So here, if you got uh, the, MS, the Microsoft MS Build GitHub repository, and look at issue 1603. There are some good explanations in here um, that you can, you can read about how, how to solve this problem. So for us, I think the easiest thing is just to use a directory.build.props file. So I'm going to say here in that file that my base output path is going to be ms build project directory slash out slash the project name slash bin. Similarly, the base intermediate output path will be the same path but with obj. So now what that means is I can get rid of bin and obj, hopefully, unless VS has them locked. And when I build, both of these projects can build, and they'll build to their own folders in the bin and obj directories. Therefore, when I do a .NET restore, uh, I'll get two separate project.assets.json files, one in, in you know, Bean Trader Client dot Bean Trader Client slash obj and one in Bean Trader Client dot core slash obj. So if I come back over here, at this point I should be able to rebuild the solution, and it should pick up that that change. Okay, awesome. It did. I've got the warning from uh, using a .NET Framework 4.6 package, which remember is allowed, and in this case should be fine. So I ignore the warning. We've just got this error about a property on my MyApps Metro window not being available. Well, remember, one of the things we changed in the previous video was we updated some NuGet packages to get versions that target .NET Core. And one of the ones we updated was the MyApps package. And I guess I can't navigate from there, but I can hop in here and do it. And what we're discovering is that some APIs have changed. Previously, there was a property on the Metro window type called title caps, but now there is not. Instead, if I search for like title, there are some other properties. We have title character casing, which is going to do the same thing, but it's a slightly more flexible API. So this is a difference between Ma Apps Metro 165 and 2.0. In general, when you upgrade your NuGet packages, especially if you upgrade across a major version boundary, you're likely to find these sorts of small differences, and you may need to make some changes to make sure that things are going to work. Uh, using the new versions. So in this case, the fix the fix is very simple. Uh, instead of using title caps, we can use title. What was it? It was title character casing, and the value will be. It's not auto completing for me, but I can come over here and see that the auto needs to the the value needs to be normal. 
Okay, there we go. Having made that change, I can now build, and that should take care of that error. Though I'm actually going to build both my projects separately because I do want to make sure, as we're making changes, I want to keep building the .NET Framework version of this project to make sure that it builds. Sure enough, it succeeds, it builds successfully. That's good. That means that this title character casing property must exist on my apps, Metro 165 and 20. If it only was on 20, then I might have to have differences in how .NET Core and .NET Framework versions of this project uh, set this property. Or, maybe the simplest thing, I can just update the previous project to also use the newer version of the NuGet package so that the code that they share will be the same. In this particular case, that's not necessary because the API that I'm using now is available on both versions, so it works fine. Um, okay, so we're able to build the old project. That's good. We've got separate obj and bin folders. Let's go ahead and hop out to the uh, console. And I'm going to do a .NET build. And again, we've got the two uh, project files, so I have to specify which one I'm building. I'm doing a .NET build on BeanTrader Client Core. So let's, let's check this out. Um, ba, 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 ba. That's interesting. So that's complaining about auto-generated XAML source not being available. I find that this is still sometimes a little bit flaky if I have VS open as well, because VS is building in the background. So, I mean, most people won't be using both the command line and Visual Studio at the same time. If you are and you see these sorts of errors, they could be uh, transient and you just need to rebuild. Okay. Now we've got 196 errors, so, you know, not too bad. I've ported projects to .NET Core that had way more than that. And you're going to see that these actually, um, we'll be able to take care of these pretty quickly. Um, just sort of glancing through them, I'm seeing a lot of this thing already contains a definition for. There's a lot of things that already, it seems like they're being defined multiple times. Um, and if we start looking at some of these these files, what we're going to realize, BeanTrader client core obj and BeanTrader client obj, WPF is going to build some source automatically for your XAML pages and drop it in the intermediate output folder. That stuff gets picked up, it gets built, great. However, we're picking up things from the wrong intermediate output folder here. Look, we're picking things up from the .NET Frameworks folder. And of course, you know, this is the sort of thing you're going to run into from time to time because we have uh, this new style csproj file that automatically includes all the cs files that are under it. And so we moved the output folders, but they're still underneath the, the path where we have our csproj files. So we need to explicitly come in here, and if there are folders, maybe output folders for different projects, other things like that, you want to exclude those from being auto-included. So I'm going to remove from compiling anything that's under out bean trader client and any subdirectory under that that is unrelated to this project so I'm going to ignore that part of the output folder and that should make a big difference come back in here we get 102 errors so we're making some progress now these errors appear to mostly be related to not being able to find types uh, for WCF communication. Now remember I was saying that uh, when you have a .NET Core app, by default it's going to include the .NET um, Core runtime assemblies, things like the base class libraries and some you know, core file I.O. APIs, anything that's in that core cross-platform .NET Core product. But there are a lot of packages that don't get included by default because they don't make sense in all scenarios. One of the ones that doesn't make sense in all scenarios is these service model APIs. So these need to be added in a separate package. Now there's different ways we can go about this. If we didn't know where these lived, if we weren't sure, there's a few ways we can go investigate. One very useful website that you might want to check out is called apisof.net. Let me take you out there. It's a catalog of all of the .NET APIs. So I could search for something like system service model Operation contract attribute is one way, and I can see that beginning with .NET Core 3.0, this is available for .NET Core, so that's good news. Pri previously it wasn't. But I can see the assembly it's in is system service model primitives. So that's going to give me an idea of what sort of package I might need to um, 
include that in my project. So if I search for system service model primitives, sure enough, there's a NuGet package with that name. Now, this particular package, being called primitives, it gives me a clue that probably I don't want to include this directly. There's probably a higher level system service model package that depends on this. And if I search for system service model, sure enough, we've got system service model net TCP, system service model duplex. Well, I'm using net TCP duplex communication, so those are probably the things I'm going to need. I can come over here, and now it's pretty easy to do a .NET add to beantrader client core.csproj package system.servicemodel.duplex, and once that's finished, I'll do system.servicemodel.nettcp. Now, I went through that to show you some of the, the websites and some of the process I use when I'm trying to figure out where a particular API came from so that I can include the right .NET related NuGet package. For many of these things, though, you won't even need to do this if you preemptively include the Microsoft uh, Windows compatibility package that I mentioned in an earlier video. This is a meta package that includes many useful .NET Framework packages that can be used on .NET Core but aren't useful in cross-platform scenarios. So they're not in the box automatically, but if you know you're only going to be running on Windows, like with a WPF or a WinForms app, then you can add a reference to Microsoft Windows compatibility and that's going to pull in for you your registry APIs, some code DOM APIs, some uh, directory services and I.O. stuff, uh, some crypto APIs that um, have different signatures than the cross-plat alternatives, some service model stuff, some ACLs APIs. These are all things that are available on .NET Core, but you wouldn't get if you were running on a different um, OS. So let's go ahead and add this package as well, because we do have registry usage. We're going to use some of these APIs. And, you know, I didn't add it initially because I wanted you to see these errors and how we fix them, but you know, in your own porting, I would recommend you just add this up front. It'll save you a little hassle because now if we come in and we build, we're going to find it's a lot cleaner. In fact, we're down to, let's see, a single error. So um, you see that cleaned a lot up. So we have, it says that trading view model 2 doesn't implement an interface member. Okay, you know what? Let's go check out this old view, old unused view model file and see what this is all about. Okay, it uh, implements I notify property changed, but it doesn't have a property changed event. So yeah, the error is correct. This will not compile. This is not good C sharp. So how did this get in here if our .NET Framework project compiled? Where does this thing live? This is under view models. Um, here it is, uh, right here. But you know, if I look at my old project, it's not there. This C sharp file is on disk, but it's not included in the project previously. And of course, I did this on purpose. You can see I put a comment here uh, that this is just here for demonstration purposes. But this is a pattern that I see a lot when I'm working with customers. They might have a lot of C sharp files on disk that weren't being used, and that's fine uh, with the old CS Proj format. Uh, they're you know, ignore it if they're not mentioned in the project file. But now with the new project file, we automatically include everything. So just be aware that in a migration scenario, if you've got extra sources sitting around on disk, we're going to try and build it. Now, if you had a lot of these, you might want to change the CS prod. You might want to not auto-include everything under, um, you know, under the current directory. And you might want to explicitly just include the c -sharp files you know that you need, and you could copy that list from the old project. But in this case, it's just one file. If it's, if it's sort of scoped, you can just add a compile or remove the same way we did for items that were in the other uh, project's output path. Or, even easier, if this is something you actually don't need, if it's not being used for reference or something, if you really, truly don't need it anymore, take this opportunity to clean up your disk and just delete it. And at this point now, uh, that was that last error, so let's go ahead and do a .NET build and see what happens. Okay, we've got 11 more errors. So it went up because the C-sharp compiler is a two-pass compiler. During its first pass, it just looks at uh, you know method signatures. It tries to make sure that all of your references are available and, and that they line up. And those were the errors we were fixing up until now, You know that impl interfaces are implemented properly and so on. Well, now that we've addressed those problems, the C-sharp compiler is successful enough that it moves on to its second passes, which is where it actually looks at implementation. So it's actually trying to turn our C-sharp into IL at this point. And so now uh, 
taking a look at the implementation of our methods, there's a second round of errors that the C-sharp compiler finds. So you're going to see this sort of two-phase pattern when you're working on a project with a lot of issues, and you know, especially if you're doing like a migration from one .NET platform to another. Um, we're at about 20 minutes now, though, and I don't want each of these individual videos to get too long, so I'm going to end this one. And in the next video, in session four, we'll go ahead and we'll finish fixing the remaining uh, compilation errors that we have from the second pass, and we'll get this, this project actually building on .NET Core. Welcome back. Let's continue fixing build issues to get our bean trader sample working on .NET Core. You remember during the last video, we started going through these build issues, and we fixed all of the errors coming from the first pass of the c -sharp compiler. So in this video, we're going to fix the remaining issues and fix everything so that the second pass succeeds and we can cleanly build for .NET Core. So here's our 11 errors that were remaining, not too many. Hop over into Visual Studio and start walking through these. The first category of error we have is with Castle Windsor APIs. Here we are trying to... Um, uh, use installers from the current assembly, and you see that from assembly.this for finding the uh, location where the installers are coming from, it says dot this is not available to, uh, for beantrader client.core, but it is available for beantrader client. Now remember, we didn't change the version of Castle Windsor we're using. This is the uh, Castle Windsor 4.1.1 being used in the .NET Core and in the .NET Framework projects. So what this means is that the different um, binaries for .NET Core and .NET Framework must have slightly different surface areas uh, for Castle Windsor. And this is not uncommon, especially around some of these reflection code paths that look at the current assembly. And it just reflects uh, some of the different APIs that the .NET Framework exposes that then change what uh, Castle Windsor is able to do. So it's the same NuGet package, but there's different... Um, binaries for different .NET targets, so there could be small differences like this. Uh, typically in these sorts of cases, though, there are easy workarounds by just using a, a different API. So in this case, instead of calling this to get the current assembly, we can say from assembly containing and pass in a type, like the current type that we're in, and it will uh, look for installers in the assembly that contains Bootstrapper, which of course will work out to be exactly the same as the assembly.this. Uh, but this API works both for .NET Core and .NET Framework, so that's the way we want to go. Similarly, in the installers themselves, when we're looking for classes to register, we can't call classes.fromThisAssembly, because that doesn't exist for Core, though it does exist for Framework in Castle Windsor. Instead, we can say from assembly containing, and we can use the same sort of pattern where we just give a type in the assembly that we care about, and it finds it that way. So that's uh, that fixes that one, and we can hop over. Now you do notice that as you're working through these, Visual Studio allows you to look at this source that's shared between the two projects from the perspective of either the .NET Framework project, where this is fine, or the .NET Core project where it's it's problematic. So depending on which target you're working on, you can change that view, which is sort of convenient. But again, we're going to change this to from assembly containing type of view model installer. Okay, and the Castle Windsor stuff should be good to go. Uh, other things, there are a lot of issues in this app.xaml, so let's take a look. And I'm going to collapse that. So a lot of these theme manager and accent related APIs appear to be missing. So if we take a look at theme manager, um, we can see that, yeah, sure enough, those APIs are not here. But if we look at this from the .NET Framework point of view, all these APIs are OK. And here, if we look at theme manager, they're there. And in fact, we see these uh, two theme manager APIs look fairly different. So now this is something that I talked about earlier. This is a case where we were using Ma Apps Metro 1.6.5. We upgraded to 2.0 so that we could, in the .NET Core project, because the version 2 of Ma Apps Metro actually targets .NET Core 3, but we didn't upgrade in the .NET Framework project, and so we never really tested out to see if there were any breaking changes in this major version change of Mops Metro, and it turns out there are. You can go online and search, and you'll find that there are, in fact, 
breaking changes in the way that themes and accents are handled in Mobs Metro 2. So we uh, have a bit of a dilemma here because we had previously upgraded our Mobs Metro dependency from 165 to 20 in order to use a package that targeted .NET Core, but now we find that the API surface area is different in Mobs Metro 2. So we either need to roll back to 165 or we need to fix our app. Now, in general, I think the best practice here is to just update your application to use the newer version. Remember, in our very first video, I said one of the things you can do to prepare for a .NET Core migration is to upgrade your NuGet packages so that you're using up-to-date versions, especially if older versions don't support .NET Standard or .NET Core. So if we had done that, we would have made the necessary changes to our app to support Mobs Metro 2 at that point, and this wouldn't be a problem. In our case, we just went ahead because I'm doing this quickly. And so now we have a bit of a dilemma. Um, if this were not a short video I'm recording, I would probably just go in and change to use Mobs Metro 2. But in this case, I'm not going to. And, and you may not want to also if you are in a scenario where you have a large dependency on a particular old version of a NuGet package, and it's going to be a lot of work to change. In my case, it wouldn't be that much work, but this video is about upgrading to .NET Core 3. It's not about upgrading to Mobs Metro 2. The alternative, of course, is that we can continue to reference the old NuGet package because we can reference .NET Framework assemblies. There's just a little bit of added risk that if those .NET Framework DLLs try to use an API that doesn't exist on .NET Core, we'll get uh, runtime errors. In this case, though, I think that the risk is fairly low, both because our Ma apps dependency is light. We're only using just a handful of APIs out of Ma apps Metro, and because it's a UI library. And I've noticed that as similar as .NET Framework and .NET Core surface areas are, the surface areas for their WinForms and WPF stacks are even more similar. So a light dependency on a UI library, it's probably safe to just continue using the older version of Mops Metro so that we don't have to pay the cost of upgrading to the 2.0 surface area right now. Uh, of course, that's just going to be some technical debt. So if you, if you were to go this route because you didn't want to upgrade to a newer package version, that's okay, but you'd want to track somewhere that there's a work item that, you know, in the future you're going to need to make that upgrade eventually. Um, also, when you do it this way, again, you're going to want to be, a, be sure to thoroughly test those code paths to make sure that everything continues to work on the old version. Okay, so we've, we've made the change, and now if I rebuild the solution, um, we should have less errors. Okay, in fact, we're down to just a single error, but we do have some new warnings. You see that we get warnings about Mops Metro 165 being restored using uh, a .NET Framework target instead of a .NET Core one. And of course, this is expected. That's what we knew would happen, and we've decided we're okay with that because it means we don't have to change how we're using the API. And we'll test this out later. But at this point, we've only got a single error left and it has to do with our WCF client. So new client.open does not exist on .NET Core. If we look at this new client, it is an instance of our BeanTrader service client, which if we look at the implementation here, this was auto-generated by service util. So this is our WCF client, which was auto-generated by service util. So this almost works on .NET Core, but it doesn't quite because there are some differences in WCF client APIs between .NET Framework and .NET Core. The largest differences are that not all of the same bindings are available. Um, most bindings are available, but WS bindings are available. Net named, I mean, WS bindings are not available on .NET Core. A net named pipe binding is not available on .NET Core. And there's a, a smaller set of um, security. You can't do message level security on .NET Core. So there are some differences there. The other large difference that you're almost certainly going to notice is that .NET Core does not use uh, configuration to set up uh, its WCF um, clients. So we don't use app config to configure our clients. Instead you have to do it in code. Now of course this WCF client that was generated by service util, when we generated it, it gave us app config to use and the client code assumes that it's going to be loading configuration from the config file. So this is not going to work anymore. What you need to do if you're migrating from .NET Framework to .NET Core using a WCF client, you need to regenerate the client. But we have tooling to do that. And there's actually two different ways that you can approach that. Um, one way is you can do it directly from Visual Studio using, uh, let me bring this over here so you can see, using their um, 
w, WCF Web Service Reference Provider tool, which makes it very easy to uh, generate a WCF client right from Visual Studio. Alternatively, we have, if you like the command line nature of service util, there is a .NET service util tool, which is a .NET CLI tool that is similar to service util, but will generate WCF clients that are .NET standard compatible. So you can use them from .NET Core or .NET Framework or other platforms. And that will work as well. So feel free to go check out either of these tools, either .NET service util for a command line option or the connected service path using Visual Studio. Um, both are good. In this case, I'm going to use it, I'm going to do it through Visual Studio because I have to know that .NET Service Util doesn't work well when you have two project files in the same folder. So if I wanted to use .NET Service Util, I'd actually have to like copy my project file someplace else, run it there, copy the client back over. It'd be a little bit of a hassle. So instead, what I'm going to do is in Visual Studio, I can right-click on the project, I go to Add, and we'll say Add Connected Service. Uh, and here, we choose WCF Web Service Reference Provider, and this is how we're going to add our WCF client through uh, Visual Studio. So we have to paste the URL of the service that we're using. We'll say Go. We'll give it uh, a namespace that makes sense, like beantrader.service. And we've got some options, which are fine. And we'll click Finish. So this is now going to generate a .NET standard com compatible uh, WCF client for us that we can use in place of the old service util generated one. So it's, it's generating it. Something that we're going to see is that this, OK, and it's going to give us a, a little website that tells us about uh, the whole connected service experience. What you're going to find, though, is that we now have, oops, uh, close this, we now have this extra folder here under connected services called Bean Trader Service, and in it we have reference.cs, and here is our um, .NET standard WCF client. You're going to find it's very similar to the one that was generated for .NET Framework use, but it's not exactly the same. In fact, if I take a look at our previous client, some of the differences you'll notice are that um, namespaces are different. Uh, in the old one, I had my models in a beantrader.models namespace, and the services themselves weren't in a namespace at all, which probably was incorrect, but I was making this sample quickly. Here, uh, on the other hand, everything is in a namespace called beantrader.service. So I can remove beantrader from my .NET Core app and just use the new client, but I'm going to have to make some changes to the code. Uh, to, to reflect the fact that the API is slightly different and that the namespaces have changed. But there's a design decision to make here. I now have two WCF clients, one of which uh, is going to work on .NET Core. Both of them can be used from .NET Framework. So I have to decide, am I going to change the code so that it always uses this new .NET standard client? Or am I going to change the code so that when I build for .NET Framework, it uses the old client, and when I build for .NET Core, it uses the new one? Both have pros and cons. They're a similar amount of work, in my opinion. What you want to base this on is whether you need your existing .NET Framework project to stay exactly as it is, or if you're OK making some changes to it. If you need, it, you know, the, the advantage of leaving the .NET Framework project targeting the old client is that you know that code works, you've been using it potentially for a long time, and you don't want to churn a stable product. But the downside is that now you're going to have different code paths where you're calling your WCF client. You're going to do it one way compiling for framework, one way compiling for core. You're going to have both of these clients checked in, and your code's going to start to bifurcate. So if possible, I think it's better to actually just update uh, both projects to use this new client. That way you uh, just have everything using the same code paths. Uh, you can make it work the same everywhere, and it's a little bit simpler at the end of the day. So that's the way I'm going to go in this demo. Uh, I understand in the real world you may not want to make large changes like swapping out your WCF clients in your existing .NET Framework project, and so it's okay to use like a pound if to say, this is the way we do it on Framework, this is the way we do it on Core, and we have two separate clients. Uh, for this case, though, let's go ahead and remove beantrader.cs because we're not going to be using that anymore. 
and instead we're going to add um, add an existing item to our .NET Framework project. We're going to add this reference.cs that was generated under connected services, making sure to add it as a link so it's one shared source file. And now we're going to have both of our um, projects using a new WCF client that is compatible with .NET standard. Now if I rebuild, I'm going to have some more errors because remember this WCF client is a slightly different shape. Uh, the, the main thing that I'm going to have to change here is I just need to update a bunch of namespaces. See, this was uh, expecting things to be in, uh, you know, to, to not be in a namespace. Now they're in the beantrader.service namespace. I'm going to fix those. Um, and it, all of these are going to be similar. I need to fix up namespaces across a few different C sharp files as well as in XAML. So this is um, kind of boring. So I'm going to pause the video for a couple minutes while I go through and fix these up. And then I'll be back, um, you know, as soon as I finish fixing these, and we will move on. Okay, I'm back, and we're getting close now. At this point, uh, we've only got two errors left uh, since I fixed all the namespace references. One of them is interesting. It's that our one of the differences in the WCF clients is that the constructor for our bean trader service client has a slightly different shape. Previously we were specifying the callback handler we wanted to use. And if we look at this, we don't have a public constructor that uh, ex uh, takes a uh, instance context or callback handler. Uh, now we do have a base constructor that takes that. So what we can do is, since this is a partial class and we know we want a constructor of a particular shape that doesn't exist, we can just add a model um, that extends the Bean Trader service client. So in my .NET Framework project, since we want this to be present in both of them, I'm going to add a new class. I'm going to call it Bean Trader service client. And I will fix the namespace to match the other one. This will be a public partial class. And I just need to make a constructor for this thing that is able to call the um, base constructor. In fact, this one right here it takes an endpoint configuration and a uh, instance context looks, looks like what we want. So Let's take a look here. Uh, this is good. I'll just copy this this uh, signature. We'll call base callback instance endpoint configuration. Okay, and. Uh, Let's put this down here for readability's sake. Okay, so now we should come back into our factory and we should be able to specify instance context and the endpoint that we want to use. Now note that we, we do need to pass this extra argument, the endpoint configuration, because remember this isn't picked up from app config anymore. It needs to be specified programmatically. And if we look at our auto-generated client, you can see that it picked up from the services uh, definition, uh, the server-side definition of the WCF service, what this endpoint should look like. It has the um, binding being configured here, our net TCP binding. It also will have the, the default endpoint that was specified by the service. And this is the stuff that previously would have been put in app config, but now it's put right here in code in the client. And so we can just specify that we want to use that configuration by using this enum value. And this should work. So we'll go ahead and rebuild again. And at this point, we only have one left. Okay, it says that open does not exist. And of course, this is not a surprise because remember we saw that the open API didn't exist way back in the first video when we ran the portability analyzer. Now open's available for .NET Framework but if we're going to be running on .NET Core as well we have to use open async. 
Now in this case, fortunately, that's an easy change because uh, we're running inside of an async method anyhow, so it's easy to drop in a wait new client on open async, and that will work. If we had decided to have separate clients for .NET Framework and .NET Core, use the old WCF client for the Framework 1 and the new one for Core, this would be a place where we might do if .NET Core, something like that, uh, and then say, you know, else we use the open API. So this is a, a place where we could have you know, potentially had different code paths for .NET Framework and .NET Core to call different open APIs on our WCF client. In this case, we decided to use the same client for both, so that's not necessary. And so we will build one more time. And we find no errors. Let's come back uh, over into our uh, command prompt. We'll try it from here. Do a .NET build of our core project. And oh, we got some transient um, WPF stuff just because I have Visual Studio open at the same time, which normally you wouldn't. But if we rebuild this, there you go, zero errors. So we have successfully built the Bean Trader sample for .NET Core 3, and it's ready to go. In the next video, in the last video, we're going to actually run it and make sure that we have tested it to, make, to ensure that everything works the same at runtime as we expect it to. Okay, we're in the home stretch now. In the last video, we got our sample uh, application building for .NET Core. Uh, so that means that we're ready to go on to the last step of the migration process to get our Bean Trader sample running completely on .NET Core 3. Uh, as you remember, I described the migration process as having four steps. First, you prepare for migration by understanding your dependencies, both framework dependencies with the portability analyzer and third-party dependencies by just reviewing them. And you get your NuGet package references into the new package reference format, which is used for um, .NET Core projects. In the second step, you create that new CS proj. You decide whether it's going to live next to your existing one or in a different folder. You add all of the resources, the custom build steps, the NuGet packages, so that your CS proj has all the right content in it. And you also, at this point, can update your NuGet packages to make sure that you're using a version that supports .NET Core or .NET Standard. In the third step, which is what we did in the previous two videos, we fix build time issues. So we make sure that our project can actually compile successfully against .NET Core. We go in, we fix up small API differences between .NET Framework and .NET Core in the framework itself, as well as maybe in the NuGet packages we're depending on. Uh, so we make sure that we can build both the new and the old projects. Also in this step, you may remember we regenerated our WCF client to be generated by an updated version of Service Util which will support .NET Standard and .NET Core. And so at this point, we can build the project. A lot of people might think we're done now since, the, since it compiles clean. But in fact, there's a, a fourth step, which is important, and that's running and testing the app. Because there are a lot of differences, well, maybe not a lot, there are some differences between .NET Framework and .NET Core that only manifest at runtime. You may get not supported exceptions or something like that. And we actually have some analyzers to help with this. If you come look at... Um, github.com slash .NET slash platform compat. These are Roslyn analyzers that will identify APIs and code patterns in your project that might build successfully, but will cause issues at runtime on .NET Core. It also identifies APIs that are supported by .NET Core on some platforms, but not other platforms. So, you know, that's not something you would need for a WPF app, but in other scenarios, it may be useful to know how cross-platform your solution will be. So those analyzers can help. Let's go ahead and do this with our bean trader sample. Okay, so here, here's our nice clean build we had last time. So now we want to actually run it. Uh, so I'll hop over here and let's, okay, I've made sure that my .NET Core project is the startup project. I will hit F5 to run. Let's see what happens. Okay. And we hit an exception. Uh, it says configuration system failed to initialize. There's an inner exception here, unrecognized uh, configuration section, system.service model. Okay, so something's wrong with our app config. And this makes sense if we come look here. You remember in the last video, I was talking about one of the differences 
uh, in using WCF on .NET Framework versus on .NET Core is that in .NET Core, uh, the WCF client is not configured using app configuration. None of this is respected. You have to do it programmatically instead. But if we look at our client that we generated, the new WCF client coming out of you know the connected services or .NET service util, this will actually be done for us in the client based on the endpoint we select. See here we're setting up our endpoint address, here we're setting up the, the binding. So all the stuff that was being done through configuration is now done through code in our WCF client. Um, so we actually can remove this. Now, you know, the difference between doing something by configuration, doing it in code, is something you may see somewhat regularly with .NET Core, because this configuration system where we're using the app.config and we access the values with the configuration manager, this works on .NET Core, and we can use it in our app. And in fact, we are using it to read these app settings. But Libraries that want to run on all .NET standard platforms can't depend on this because these same configuration APIs aren't all available on .NET standard. They're available on .NET Core, not on .NET standard. So that means things like uh, you know, system service model, WCF. If WCF wants to work across all .NET standard platforms, this can't be the way that configuration is done. So you know, if you want to configure using a configuration file, you still can have app settings and you can programmatically set up your WCF client using those settings, but in general you're going to see less of an emphasis on app.config um, just because it doesn't exist on .NET Standard. Instead, in .NET Standard you might use the new ASP.NET Core style configuration using Microsoft Extensions configuration uh, because that does work on .NET Standard. Um, in this case, though, we're only running on .NET Core, so it's safe for us to use Configuration Manager and App Config. We just can't use the WCF-specific parts of that. Okay. So let's go ahead and hit F5 again. Let's see if we get a little farther this time now that we have removed that config section. Uh, by the way, that's another reason that it's good that we have our .NET Framework and .NET Core versions of the app both using the new WCF client. Because if only the .NET Core version was using it and the .NET Framework one was still using the old client where we were reading configuration from app config, we'd end up having two app config files, one for .NET Framework with WCF stuff and one for .NET Core without it. Uh, anyhow, we, ha we have hit F5 and our app has launched. This is good. Let's go ahead and log in. Ah, another exception. Operation is not supported on this platform. Um, so we can take a look at the, the stack trace here. Function of begin invoke. Well, it turns out that delegate uh, dot begin invoke and end invoke are not supported on .NET Core. Uh, there's a good discussion about why this is out on GitHub. If you want to go read up on it, it's got lots of details. It's in the .NET Core FX issue number five nine four zero. Basically, what it comes down to is these APIs have a dependency on uh, remoting infrastructure which just doesn't exist on .NET Core so you can't use them but there are a lot more modern a lot of more modern alternatives that are better anyhow so it shouldn't be too big a deal to get away <coughs> from begin invoke and end invoke um, since it's not possible to support them on .NET Core now <coughs> one interesting thing about these is that they don't turn up in the API port report so you might not realize that you had this dependency even though you know the port because the portability analyzer didn't call it out the, the reason for that is because these are defined on the delegate types, and many times delegates are defined in user code, and they will automatically have a begin invoke and end invoke method that was generated by the compiler, and those still won't work even though they're in uh, user code, but because they're in user code, API port doesn't see them. So uh, anyhow, point is we can't use begin invoke, but like I was saying, there are better ways to do this now. First option, if you're calling an API that has an async alternative, just do an, uh, just await an async call. In fact, in this case, I'm, you know, this is a little bit contrived. I'm using begin invoke to call a delegate on a method that's actually an async method, uh, which is not something you're likely to see in the real world because, of course, the trivial fix for this is to await trading service dot... Uh, what was it we were calling? Get current trader info. Yeah, my IntelliSense is slow, but get current trader info async. Like uh, this, you know, and we can say current trader equal. Th this right here is the um, correct way to do it. 
because um, in general, async methods are going to be superior to calling begin invoke. In the worst case, they both just go running on a different thread. In a lot of cases, if there is an async alternative, this is going to actually be non-blocking, um, which begin invoke typically isn't. So if you have an async alternative, call the async alternative. Now in this case, I'll pretend like I don't, because in a lot of times you won't, and I want to sh sort of show what that looks like. Um, you can use task.run as an alternative. Task.run is able to run some action or some func on, uh, you know, on a different thread for you uh, in the same way that begin invoke would, but it does it without using that uh, remoting infrastructure under the covers, so it continues to work on .NET Core. So all you need to do is you can replace your begin invoke with a call to invoke because that should work. So I can take this same delegate, this, this user info retriever func, and I can um, still use it, but I don't want to call begin invoke. Instead, I just call invoke in a task.run, and this now is going to be equivalent to calling user info retriever begin invoke. Now in this case, we take the result and we do something with it. So there's different ways to do this. I can either await that here. I can say, you know, uh, var task is this, or, you know, we'll even call it result so that we get the, the same naming as before. And then I can await result. Um, another option is we can say task.run continue with, and continue with will provide a continuation uh, task for after this one, this initial one completes, which is very similar to what's being done here, where we're uh, invoking this delegate, and then after it completes, we run some code. So we can actually do almost exactly the same thing here. We're going to say continue with, get our result, and I could just copy the exact same code we had before, uh, but drop in result instead of end invoke. And this should be equivalent because now we're running the invoke method asynchronously with task.run. And when it finishes, then we run our follow-up here. Instead of calling end invoke, I just get the result as a parameter, uh, you know, in this continue with expression. So at this point, okay, it's complaining that I need a task scheduler, which I will add. And, okay, this should be equivalent code that doesn't use the begin invoke and end invoke APIs, which aren't supported on core. So let's go ahead and F5 again, see what happens. And actually, I should probably just delete this code. We don't need it commented out. F is not allowed. You know what, I, I want to get rid of that. So let's delete it and F5. Okay, it's building launching it's doing stuff okay here we are our app has started up I'll log in as Mike and it has logged me in we are communicating with our WCF backend we're displaying uh, data I can accept trades here I'll accept this trade from Daniel okay I now have five more green beans and 20 less blue beans I can make my own trades maybe I feel like I want to get uh, even more green beans do this I can I can cancel trades uh, I, let's see if we can sign out we can sign out sign in again accept a trade sign out sign in at this point I think we can say that our app is working correctly uh, and the most important part is it's working correctly on .NET Core if I come over here to the debugger and I look at the modules, you can see that these modules are all loading from .NET shared Microsoft .NET Core app 3.0. So this is in fact running on .NET Core, not .NET Framework. Um, and you know, I know that this was a longish series of videos, but really, I mean, if I wasn't talking through it, this would have been an hour. And this, again, it's a simple app, but you know, hour, hour and a half of coding, we've taken a WPF app that uses WCF client functionality, it uses Castle Windsor, Mile Apps Metro, and so on, and we have ported it to work exactly the same on .NET Core. I hope this was a useful overview. Um, just to review, here's the steps we went through. I'll be sure in the comments below to link 
uh, useful docs as far as the migration process, a blog where we talk about all of this, uh, some of the tools like the API port analyzer and the compat analyzers. But uh, hopefully it gives you an overview of what the process looks like for moving from .NET Framework to .NET Core.